We've now finished with the chapter on theory of choice, and we're going to start the next chapter, which is concerning changes in income and prices. We're first going to do changes in income. Changes in prices come later because they're more difficult. <clears throat> so what I've got is a standard graph with a uh, consumer consuming X on the horizontal axis and Y, which is depicted on the vertical axis, and an initial budget constraint I'll call BC naught. And the question is going to be, what happens when this consumer's income goes up? When his income goes up, clearly his affordable set is going to get bigger. So the budget constraint is going to have to shift out. Next question is, in what way does it shift out? And I claim that the new budget constraint is going to be parallel to the old budget constraint. The reason is that, as we've seen several times before, the slope of a budget constraint is minus px over py. And when income changes, neither of those two things, neither px nor py, changes. And therefore, the slope doesn't change. So a new income generates a new budget constraint, which has the same slope as the old budget constraint, and therefore which is parallel to the old budget constraint. Now, if I were considering a decrease in income, the budget constraint would the affordable set would shrink, so the budget constraint would move down and to the left. But since I'm here talking about an increase in income, the budget constraint moves moves uh, out. So a new one might look like this, a new uh, uh, budget constraint. So we'll call that BC1. So BC1 has expanded the affordable set, and you can see that BC1 is parallel to BC0, which shows that the only thing that's happened is an increase in income. If income increases even further, then I can draw yet another budget constraint representing another affordable set, which is uh, which is even far, far, farther out. Let's see how that would look. Okay, call that BC3. The next thing to do is to ask how the consumer responds to these increases in the budget constraint. I guess I should call this BC2, shouldn't I? And to get the consumer's response, we want to draw indifference curves and then calculate how the consumer uh, how the consumer responds to these changes. So that might be the original indifference curve and this the new point. I could draw another one here and make the new point like this, and another one perhaps so here, and make the new one like this. Notice these three indifference curves are consistent with each other, even if you were to extend them, for example, like this, and like this, and like this, they wouldn't touch, or at least they wouldn't necessarily touch. Sometimes students draw in different curves like this. Maybe the first one's like like this, and the second one's like this. And you can see that it's a little hard, it would be a little hard to draw an extension of the second one without it crossing the first one. So one has to be somewhat careful when drawing in different curves to make sure that even extensions of them would at least wouldn't have to cross. That's a fairly minor point. Getting back to the large graph, another thing we can do after having determined how the consumers how the consumer responds to these increases in income is to connect the optimal points with a line like this. Now this is a somewhat unusual case that I've drawn here. A more typical case, or at least a case that's easier to draw, would be this. And in this case, a line connecting these points is uh, if not straight, at least it's upward sloping. But what I've shown in the, in the main the graph, the large graph, is that this line doesn't have to be upward sloping. 
it could be it could be downward sloping. This line is called the income expansion path. Because it traces out the optimal combinations of x and y as income changes. And so the income expansion path over here is is was this line that uh, that I just drew earlier. So you can see that in the upper right hand corner the income expansion path was upper sloping. In the large graph, it's upper sloping between the second and third points. It's almost vertical there. But between the first and second points, it's downward sloping. There's another way we can depict how the consumer responds to changes in income. And to illustrate that, I'm going to put numbers on these on these points on um, BC not let's call this point a let's assume that the first coordinate is 10 and the second coordinate is let's say it's also 10 for the second point B Let's say that its x coordinate is 25, and its y coordinate is 8. And for the last point c, let's say its x coordinate is 26, and its y coordinate is 13. Then the other way of depicting these relationships is as follows. We draw two graphs. First graph has x on the horizontal axis. Second graph has y on the horizontal axis. Oh, sorry, that's uh, not what I wanted to say. The, both graphs have i on the horizontal axis. The first graph has x on the vertical axis. The second graph has y on the vertical axis. So here we're showing income versus consumption. I don't know what these income levels are, but I'll, I'll call them i naught, i1, and i2, i0, i1, and i2, and they correspond to bc0, bc1, and bc2. So income i0 corresponds to bc0, income i1 corresponds to bc1, and income i2 corresponds to bc2. The graph point A, its x-coordinate is 10, so to have a point at i0 and 10, and point A's y coordinate is also 10, so I have a point at I naught. I'm going to put 10 in a slightly different place for y. It'll turn out the graph will look better that way. For point B, its x coordinate is 25, so if I've got 25 here, then B is income level I1. Have a point. B's y coordinate is 8. B is income level I1, and that gives a y value of 8. So I1 gives a y value of 8. Point C is corresponding to income level I2. Its x coordinate is 26. So this is 26. And I2, I give rise to that. And C's y coordinate is 13. So 13 corresponds, uh, income level I2 corresponds to a y consumption of 13. We can now join these with straight lines. These are not income expansion paths. Income expansion paths, uh, what I talked about before, to get an income expansion path, you have to have commodities on the axes. Here we don't have commodities on the axes. We have income on one of the axes. And so these are not income expansion paths. These two curves are called Engel curves. So Engel curve Angle curves relate income on the horizontal axis to consumption on the vertical axis. Just a historical note here, angle curves were named after 
Friedrich Engel. Sorry, what I wanted to say is Friedrich Engels were not named after Friedrich Engels. Friedrich Engels is a famous mid 19th century German economist who was the co author of, with Karl Marx. Instead, Engel curves are named after Ernst Engel, with no S on the end, who was a late 19th century German economist who studied consumption. So don't get these two guys mixed up. It's Ernst Engel for whom Engel curves are named after.